What is self-injury? It is the deliberate, socially unacceptable damage to one's own body tissue without the intent to die. And I emphasize that for a reason, and I'll come back to that in a second, okay? So this behavior, it's intentional, it's deliberate. So really what to take from that is the individuals partaking in this are doing it for a reason. Um, the reason, however, can be complex and sometimes really hard to get to um, because a lot of times we tend to focus on the behavior rather than what's really under the beha behavior. <coughs> Excuse me, my allergies are killing me today, so my throat might kind of go in and out. I apologize. So it's unacceptable in nature, meaning that society really deems this as not the norm. You know, When you think about it, if you're walking down the street and you see someone with cuts all over their arm, people tend to have a reaction to that. More so than if you walk past someone who has like a full tattoo sleeve, right? You know, That's become more socially acceptable, even though at one point it really wasn't. So when we think about this behavior, there's a lot of fear tied into it because we don't necessarily completely understand the behavior. And so when we don't understand something, it's natural as humans to have fear behind that. And the thing to really take from that though as clinicians, practitioners, is that our fear and our reaction also impacts our clients and the individuals that we're working with. So understanding that our fear and the way we react can sometimes really isolate these individuals, which then causes them to not want to open up, not want to share about what they're going through. And also, they get really good at hiding it eventually, once those reactions, they see that in individuals. So it is self-inflicted bodily harm or disfigurement. I have a hard time with that word sometimes because it seems very extreme. I like to look at it as this behavior is kind of like on a spectrum. There's not a one size fits all. We have clients who come in that have very superficial cuts um, or burns or anything like that. But then when you think about it, there's on the opposite side of that where individuals sometimes end up in the hospital needing stitches to heal wounds, anything like that. And I think that also ties into kind of that fear of, okay, well, if this individual starts here, if they continue, are they going to end up on this other side of the spectrum? Or if this individual's already over here, does that mean the next the next step is them actually completing maybe suicide. So going back to where I emphasize the no intent to die. So this behavior is not rooted in suicide or suicidal ideation, hence the non-suicidal uh, self-injury. Um, and so really what's interesting about this is individuals will often report that this behavior keeps them from actually dying. This is their way that they cope with things and this is a way that they get through the day to day to continue on to the next day. So the behavior can be repetitive. Um, oftentimes in a lot of the studies we find that individuals will report at least having um, done self-injury once in their lifetime. But for individuals that it doesn't work, that makes sense. They do it, it didn't do anything for them, so move on to the next coping strategy. But for individuals that they do this and it works, hey, why not keep doing this if it's doing what I need it to do? Um, and then, of course, you know, when we think about self-injury, it encompasses a lot of different behaviors. Typically, we see the cutting. That's the most common form. But we see burning. We see scratching. Um, I've seen you know, picking at scabs to where they won't heal properly, um, putting um, objects under the skin, even ingesting chemicals. You know, When we think about the whole Tide Pod challenge that happened recently, you kind of have to wonder, was that self-injury in a way? Um, and then, of course, you, you've kind of already heard us talk a little bit about the fact that the words are kind of interchanged. So, you know, you hear self-injury, non-suicidal self-injury, or NSSI, um, self-harm, self-mutilation. As we continue with the presentation, you'll kind of hear us interchange those, but they're all the same thing. So, the prevalence. So, What's crazy is when reading the literature and looking at studies, the prevalence rates are kind of all over the place. So we have to look at it as kind of this, again, is not a one size fits all. Every individual is different, every individual is unique, and the behavior is very unique to the individual. So one of the um, studies that I have here listed um, took a sample of adolescents and adult populations, and 10 to 30% of them said that they had at least engaged in self-injury once in their lifetime. 
So kind of going back to that idea of maybe it didn't work for them, so they only had to do it that one time. But then for others, they continue to do the behavior. When we think about it, it can become not just repetitive, but habitual in a way. You know, most of us in the morning sometimes have a cup of coffee to get our day started. Some of these individuals have to do this to get their day started and to make it through the day. Um, another one um, in a psychiatric sample actually found that 40 to 60% of participants said that they had engaged in self-injury. So then that kind of, when I look at those numbers, makes me think about the fact of how are these individuals identifying what self-injury is? because it is such a unique experience to the individual, how are they labeling it? You know, when we think about it in a hospital setting, they might be getting the psychoeducation that teaches them what self-injury is, how it's helping them, how it's considered a coping strategy. But maybe in other settings, that's not what they're hearing. And so an individual might see that hitting themselves isn't self-injury, instead cutting is. So because this is all self-reported, they may not report that it's actually self-injury. Um, also, this is a little, you know, a few years back, so bear with me on this one, but um, between the years 2005-2011, they found that prevalence rates actually stabilized. So in a way, we kind of want to be like, all right, so it's not getting worse, that, that's good news, but at the same time, it's not getting better. It's kind of just there. I mean, you all have continued to see this be an issue in your settings. So, you know, that's why we do these presentations, and that's why you guys are all here, too, because we want to find better ways to help these individuals that are partaking in this behavior. And then, of course, lastly, when we think about um, self-injury, we typically see that it starts in um, mid-adolescence and goes into um, early adulthood. But I've seen individuals start as young as maybe seven, eight years old. And um, I actually had a professor share with me one time that she knew a woman personally that was self-harming into her 80s. And for her, it was completely normal. It was just part of her daily life. You know, It was kind of part of that routine. So really, when we're looking at self-injury, just remembering that it's about the individual, it's very complex and there's a lot of layers to it. And so one of the other layers that Dr. Moyer is going to go into is talking about some of the risk factors associated. Okay, thanks. Okay, I'm gonna go back just one second to so prevalence. And I'm, this is really interesting to me being, you know, um, in, in the research aspect of it. So we have all these numbers listed in prevalence, but I'm always interested in the, so the studies, how they collect the data. Because how do you collect data on a large sample population and asking, do you hurt yourself? Because some people may think, you know, okay, I hit myself, like Sydney said, do I hit myself? Do I cut myself? Is that self injury? And I always, uh, so looking at, I always question numbers like this because how do you get people, how do you know if people are um, answering honestly? I know for one of the, so the, to the, uh, throughout adolescent and adult populations, I know one of the ways that they collected that is they looked at a large school district and sent out a survey to all the students. Well, first of all, they had to send a consent form home to the parents to get them to okay to take this survey, but it was a survey on all sorts of different behaviors and self-injury was one of those questions on there. So did you check, have I participated in this behavior? And it's on that day, did that person believe, yes, I did it, did I not do it? Did they have consent to take it? So always looking at, um, I, I don't know, the, the, it's interesting to me how they collect the, the, the information. Also, the beginning in mid to early adolescence, and if you look at that, that area in, developmentally, mid to early adolescence is going through puberty. There's a lot of, so uh, I was gonna say students, but children are growing away from their parents, not in a, in a way of they're developing their own personalities. They're trying to fit out, where do I fit in? Where, what is my, who am I? What is my identity? And sometimes that can be very difficult to find. Your body's going through a lot of changes. When we look at why people do this in, in, in a few slides here, it's, well, am I happy with who I am? Am I happy with my body? Am I happy with where I fit in? And so this, depending on the reason behind why they're doing it, it can, it can um, explain a lot about why it's starting at those times. Well, the other thing that's interesting that's right now, so when the, so research around this really started to or get more um, widespread in the, I would say, late 90s, early 2000s. And so it was becoming more socially acceptable. You had more pop culture, it was you know, in TV shows, that sort of thing. If you look at now, those people that were self-injuring back then, they are now parents 
uh, not all of them, but some of them are. So you might have kids learning from their parents' coping skills on how to do that, not necessarily from their friends or from peers or from other places, but some of, if, my, if my mom or my dad or my aunt or uncle did this, hey, maybe it's an effective thing for me also. What do people say? Why do, why do they do this? Yeah. Okay, so it takes away, it's a, it replaces the emotional pain or gets rid of that. Um, yeah. Punish themselves. Punish themselves. Okay, yeah. Okay, so I had somebody one time to, to explain it to me that they didn't, they felt like a dead branch or a dead piece of wood and it was, am I still alive? And so if I bleed, I feel like I'm still alive. Okay, anything else? Yeah. Yes, a way of that I can uh, almost, instead of punishing myself, I can punish you. I can control a situation, yeah. Okay, so y'all covered them all, so we'll just skip through the, no. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Okay, so it's a poor coping mechanisms. A and so a coping, coping with uh, emotional uh, issues, uh, instead of, I had somebody explain it to me one time that it was, now this is a while back, so it was like a, a skipping song or something, things that they, maybe they had a test, maybe they had a relationship uh, concern, maybe they were, they felt like their parents were gonna get upset with them, something like that, and they couldn't stop thinking about it. And so it was a way to cope with that and make that go away. Hey, if I hurt here, then this goes away for a little bit. 